Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Stretch, an Education and Training Specialist with the Institute of Child Nutrition, and I would like to welcome you to the March School of Nutrition Star Webinar on Strategies for Promoting School of Breakfast. In order to meet the unique training, technical assistance, and professional development needs of School of Nutrition professionals, ICN has launched the School of Nutrition Star Strategies trainings, action plans, and resources initiative to help develop goals and best practices to improve program administration and operations. The School of Nutrition STAR program will offer a multitude of elements that include face-to-face -face workshops, virtual instructor-led trainings, webinars, and spotlight success stories to proactively offer standardized training real-life strategies of program implementation, mentorship and coaching to develop action plans and goals, along with training and facilitation techniques, and access to free resources and education materials to assist school and nutrition professionals with navigating through the enhanced responsibilities of the School of Nutrition operation. The Institute of Child Nutrition has collaborated with the USDA to host monthly webinars. The STAR webinar series is designed as a communication platform. It features school districts that have implemented creative strategies and best practices for common school of nutrition topics, as well as allied organizations who develop and offer free resources to support School of Nutrition program. The Institute has created a website for all materials and resources specifically related to the webinars. You can find the information at theicn.org slash star. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Strategies for Promoting School of Breakfast. During today's webinar, all attendees are muted. There will be time for questions following the speaker's presentations. If you have a question, please type it into the question box on your screen. Handouts are available and can be downloaded directly from your webinar panel. We will try to get to as many questions as possible, but due to our time constraints, every question may not get answered during the webinar. Within 24 hours, to the end of the presentation, you will be asked to complete an evaluation. After completion of the evaluation, you will receive a certificate. On March 2, 2015, USDA Food and Nutrition Services published the Professional Standards for School and Nutrition Professionals. The Food and Nutrition Services publish a final rule in the Federal Register on March 1st, 2019 to add four flexibilities to the hiring standards for school and nutrition program directors in small local educational agencies and new state directors of school and nutrition programs under the professional standard regulations for the National School Lunch Program and School of Breakfast Program. The rule requires a minimum amount of annual annual training hours for all state directors of school and nutrition programs, state directors of distributing agencies, school and nutrition program directors, managers, and staff. Required training topic areas will vary according to position and job requirements. There are also minimum hiring standards for new state directors of school and nutrition program, state directors of distributing agencies that oversee USDA foods and school and nutrition programs. For additional information, please visit the link noted on the slide. The topics covered in today's webinar fall under the key area communications and marketing and meet the USDA Professional Standard Code 4120. Before we begin today's webinar, we would like to bring to your attention some new face-to-face -face training resources that are available free of charge. Please visit the ICN website to learn more about these and other trainings. Our panelists for today are Carol Chong. Carol is the National Nutrition Advisory Health School Programs for the Alliance 
for a Healthier Generation and joined the organization over five years ago. As a national nutrition advisor, Carol provides technical assistance to healthy schools and communities. Carol also works across the Alliance in providing technical assistance and support in strategic partnerships, grants, and fee-for-service operate opportunities that align with their mission of changing the environment for children's health encompassing any food and nutrition related scope of practice. Carol previously has worked for almost 15 years in Miami-Dade County Public Schools, Miami, Florida, and served as the Director of Food and Menu Management. She was instrumental in changing the face of the food by increasing the quality of products and thereby increasing student participation of the School Meal Program. Before taking a career redirection into child nutrition, Carol spent the majority of her time in the health care arena. She also held positions as adjunct faculty at Pratt University, New York University, and Miami-Dade College for nutrition, dietetics, and hospitality management courses. Lindsay Trawali is a registered dietitian and nutrition services supervisor for school excuse me, Seattle Public Schools. Before coming to Seattle Public Schools, Lindsay worked in eating disorder field in both partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs, which she integrates into school nutrition using Ellen Satter's philosophies and a big picture mindset. Lindsay has served as a board member of the North Sound Dietetic Association and is a current member of the School of Nutrition Association and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. In addition, we have Tom Hunter Pratt, who is ICN's multimedia specialist and is very instrumental in the technology aspect of this webinar. The learning objectives for today's webinar is, Attendees will identify strategies for promoting school breakfast. And now I will turn the webinar over to Carol. Thank you, Teresa. Healthy Generation believes that all young people deserve a chance to live healthier lives. This begins by ensuring that all kids have access to nutritious, healthy foods and physical activity. We understand that where children live directly affects their health. As a result, we focus our work on the underserved communities across the country. We're committed to building healthier communities for all children, making sure that the places they spend time in schools, homes, and after school programs have the tools and resources they need to provide and promote good health. We have extensive research through our work with schools, communities, and businesses. We have reached more than 28 million children nationwide. We believe in the power of relationships and partnerships at every level. We work on the ground with school staff and teachers and at high levels with corporate CEOs. Our top and bottom approach results in systemic change that positively affects kids' health, from what they're eating in restaurants and eating in school, and especially during classroom celebrations, to how often they're moving in their after school programs. We believe that all kids deserve a healthy future. Our programs are designed to prioritize serving kids in under-resourced communities, but any school or youth serving organization in the country can access our services. We've worked in all 50 states over 12 years. Our field experience is unmatched and our reach to 40,000 schools and 6,000 youth serving sites add value and community credibility to our national work. Healthier Generations Healthy Schools program is the nation's largest in-school child obesity prevention and health initiative. This has helped 40,000 schools build healthier environments for 21 million children nationwide. Healthier Generation is widely regarded as the leading experts in informing and shaping school health policies and practices, and our scientific leadership is unmatched. 
We work closely with federal agencies on supporting implementation of federal school wellness policy requirements, and the USDA has recognized our model school wellness policy as the most authoritative resource for school, field, school health field. And our program is making real impact. Multiple evaluation studies conducted by Healthier Generation and other leading researchers in the child health field demonstrate that when schools implement the practices, policies, and environmental changes promoted by the Healthy Schools program, children report consuming healthier foods and beverages, including more fruits and vegetables, and participating in increased amounts of physical activity. In addition, the CDC published a study in preventing chronic disease, which found that meaningful participation in the Healthy Schools program is linked to reductions in the prevalence of overweight and obesity among students in high need school areas. Our Healthy Schools program is making real impact. A study in 2015 in the CDC's Journal of Preventing Chronic Disease found that participation in the Healthy Schools program is linked to reduction of obesity and, and um, overweight. We also work in the out of school time arena using these same criteria. We work to make the marketplace healthier. We believe every child, no matter where they live, should have equitable and affordable access to healthier foods and beverages. To create an equitable food program, we develop and, um, and implement strategies to change the supply through groundbreaking commitments and partnerships with food and beverage manufacturers, increase access through strategic partnerships with retailers and create demand for healthier food by educating and inspiring kids and their families within communities. Our landmark agreement with the American Beverage Association has contributed to 90% reduction in calories from beverages shipped to American schools since 2004. Now let us address the most important meal of the day, healthy school breakfast. So I want you to think back to this morning when your day started. Did you fuel yourself properly to make it through this virtual training? and through all the phone calls and emails, et cetera, that may be sitting on, on your, um, your computer. Starting the day with breakfast, breaking the fast, jump starts the brain for higher achievement and productivity. Just to get us into thinking about the most important meal of the day, please answer the poll about breakfast. So let's see, everybody got the right answer. Increases hyperactivity, which of course is not true. It actually decreases hyperactivity.
So we see that everyone got the answer correctly, that um, it does not increase activity, hyperactivity, I'm sorry, it actually decreases hyperactivity. So one of the benefits of breakfast is getting kids ready to learn. Hi, Carol, click on your slide there to bring it to the front. And you should be able to move forward after that. Good, thank you. Sure. So during our session today, we're going to cover the USDA's National School Breakfast Program, including how school nutrition staff can help to increase participation. We will discuss fun ways to market your breakfast program and provide you with a great resource for fun breakfast menus. Finally, we will focus on the customer with ways to get student input and their approval. The School Breakfast Program is a federally funded meal program that provides free and reduced price meals to low-income students across the country. It actually started in 1966 as a two-year pilot project in areas where children had to travel great distances to school or in schools located in poor areas. With, with many um, modifications, it became a system of specific per meal reimbursement implemented in 1973. And in 1975, the school breakfast program became a permanent entitlement program. School districts and independent schools that choose to participate in a program must serve breakfast meals meeting federal nutrition requirements and offer free or reduced price breakfast to all eligible children. In exchange, participating institutions receive cash subsidies from the USDA for each reimbursable meal served. Today, more low-income children across the country are getting the nutrition they need to learn and thrive through the school breakfast program. And according to the annual school breakfast scorecard released by the Food Research and Action Center, or PRAC, an average um, school day in 2017-18 school year, nearly 12.5 million low-income students participated in the National School Breakfast Program, which actually increased over 1.2% from the prior year. And every year they're seeing increases in, um, in participation. Bre breakfast, break the fast. Jump starts the brain with fuel for learning. Students who eat school breakfast have improved attendance, punctuality, and decreased anxiety, depression, and hyperactivity. They're better behaved and ready to learn. Studies conclude that children who eat school breakfast have improved standardized test scores. According to FRAC, students who skip breakfast or eat a partial breakfast do not perform at the same levels as those that eat a full breakfast meal. The students that eat a complete breakfast meal make fewer errors in math. They complete their work faster, especially in numbers checking tests. They're more alert, show improved cognitive function, memory, attention to details, and have better attendance and decreased tardiness. Also, favorable weight-related outcomes such as lower BMI, lower waist circumference are associated with school breakfast participation. And we all know about the pangs of hunger, right? They're uncomfortable, which results in distractions to achieving their full potential. Eating meals that are adequate to fuel the whole child is imperative for the success in the learning environment. I had the experience of seeing a little girl in my son's kindergarten class who would cry every day for two weeks that she had a tummy ache. And she would be sent to the front office with no avail. Third week, the teacher decided to send her to the school cafeteria and she was fed breakfast. Guess what happened? She went back to class, a happy camper. So she went to breakfast every day. Thereafter, there was no disturbance in class and she was ready to learn. So with widespread knowledge of, and the importance of breakfast, let's work, let's look at some resources, I'm sorry. With all of these hurdles for families to face, schools are a powerful place to feed, feed um, students healthy meals. 
For school staff, these challenges can seem difficult to overcome. And today, we're going to provide ideas to support participation in your school breakfast program. Any child at a participating school has access to school breakfast, regardless of their income eligibility. However, their status determines whatever price they're paying for that meal, whether it, they get it for free, they pay um, for a reduced price breakfast, or if they're a paid student. There are also programs that school districts can take advantage of to offer free breakfast to all students. For example, community eligibility provision allows high property schools to offer free breakfast and lunch meals to all students. Schools do not need to collect and process school meal applications, nor track meals served by the uh, feed category, but must count the number of meals served each day, administrative cost savings, Streamlined services and increased participation are the benefits. Provision to allow schools to offer free breakfast and or lunch to students. Schools must, however, collect school meal applications and count and claim meals by fee category during one year, which is the base year of the four year cycle to determine the rate of reimbursement for meals served in each eligibility. And non pricing is a method that schools may use to recover reimbursement for the breakfast served under the three tier federal fee categories of free, reduced price and paid with no payment collected for this from the student served. And this might be referred to um, as universal by some. Schools must continue to collect school meal applications each year and count and claim meals as free, reduced price and or paid. Breakfast for all can help end the stigma of free breakfast boost participation in child nutrition programs and eliminate the burden of collecting fees, and most importantly, feed hungry children. We know that a hungry brain needs fuel, which is the rationale for nourishing brains and bodies of children at school. Breakfast meals must meet the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, nutrition standards, and meal pattern requirements for reimbursement for the meal served though the menu choices are at the discretion of the school food authorities. This ensures that students enter the classroom nourished and ready to learn. Breakfast must provide one fourth of a child's daily needs for protein, calcium, iron, vitamins A and C and calories as outlined in the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and required by the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act also requires that offer versus serve be implemented at breakfast. Offer versus serve must include offering at least four food items from the three required food components, the grains, fruits, and fluid milk, in at least the daily minimum amounts. Under offer versus serve, the students must select three food items, including at least one half cup of fruit, to have a reimbursable breakfast. And might I add that it, it might also be an option of, of vegetable instead of fruit or in addition to. Children who make their own food choices are more likely to eat the foods that they select rather than throwing out the food. Offer versus serve is an approach to menu planning and meal service that helps reduce food waste and costs while maintaining the nutritional value of the meal. The majority of schools that offer school lunch also offer breakfast. However, it is often underutilized. In fact, on average, less than half the children who are eligible for a free or reduced price breakfast are eating it each day, even though we've seen some increases in the numbers. According to an analysis by the California Food Policy Advocates, the fiscal benefits to schools associated with increased participation in the school breakfast program include increased average daily attendance funding and increased federal and state reimbursements for meals served. The operational logistics of school breakfast programs significantly affect the reach to students. And understanding the different models for breakfast can help your school choose the best fit for your students and increase breakfast participation. Many of you may be familiar with the CDC School Health um, Index tool which is a tool that helps schools improve nutrition and physical activity environments. 
This particular criterion asks the school use strategies to maximize the school breakfast program. It covers various school breakfast models designed to maximize student participation in the school breakfast program. Traditional breakfasts are served in a school cafeteria before the bell. The cafeteria staff are able to prepare for service and have multiple serving lines and points of service, etc. This may provide opportunity for family engagement and students and families can have breakfast together for an affordable price. In my, in the, my previous district, I compare the price of an average breakfast from the drive through quote unquote, to our meal that, that we were serving up for breakfast and found that families could possibly buy two to three meals at school for one drive through meal. In addition, some of our schools made coffee available for a nominal charge that really also appealed to the, to the parents. This helped to bring students in and increase participation levels. The grab and go model is convenient for students and nutrition staff because it takes less time to prepare than most traditional breakfasts. Handheld breakfast items picked up by students in high traffic areas alleviates the long lines. It may be served from one area in the serving line in the cafeteria or served from mobile carts when students begin arriving at school. So the grab and go option available for in breakfast after the bell as well and is used for expanding breakfast service options. Breakfast staff of the Bell allows more schools to maximize their efforts of changing the ways they offer breakfast. Breakfast in the classroom, for example, offers delivery options, direct to classroom by food and nutrition services employees, picked up by student representatives, or picked up on the way to class as students enter the building from kiosks in designated areas. Breakfast in the classroom allows students to eat together in the classroom at the start of the day. And during that 10 to 15 minutes it takes for students to eat, teachers take attendance, gather homework, make announcements, and in schools I've observed also that they use this time for enrichment opportunities where while the kids are eating in the classroom. Breakfast in the classroom provide comfort to students in a familiar surrounding of their classroom. And this provides for more students consuming a nutritionally substantive breakfast meal, more fruits and, and dairy products compared to students eating a traditional breakfast. In addition, schools that offer breakfast in a classroom free to all students experience an increased sense of community, reduce stigma associated with eating breakfast at school, and realize increase in meal participation levels that positively impact the school nutrition program operations. Another second chance breakfast opportunity is breakfast after the bell that utilizes the grab and grow model to make meals available to students after the first period and especially in secondary schools. It is popular with the older kids who may want to hang out with their friends when they arrive at school and go to the traditional breakfast um, service inside the cafeteria. Breakfast served following the first instructional period uh, provides students with a nutrition break and students who ate a little at home or maybe no breakfast at all is able to be nourished for the rest of the learning day. A mid-morning breakfast also gives students a nutritious choice versus vending machines that they may have been tempted to stop at. The annual scorecard from FRAC referenced earlier confirmed that when breakfast is moved out of the cafeteria and served after the first bell, participation increases and more children reap the benefits. A healthier generation or smart food planner is a one-stop shop for recipes and menus. And here's a sample of a menu for breakfast after the bell. It is important to market your school breakfast program throughout the year. Here's an example of an age-appropriate poster from USDA Team Nutrition. This would be great for middle or high school students. Something like the art poster on the right would be more appropriate for an elementary school. Schools can hold art contests to jazz up the cafeteria or the hallways and promote student participation.
Take advantage also of morning announcements. Share the menu. Remind students that breakfast gives them the energy to start their school day. And promote breakfast the day before, telling them what's going to be on the menu for tomorrow. Students are the primary customer of the school breakfast program. It is important to think about what products your school is serving and the presentation. We eat with our eyes and kids are no different. Participation will increase with appealing foods displayed in an attractive manner and with staff who welcome customers with a smile. Host nutrition staff professional development trainings where staff can learn new techniques to display foods and test new breakfast items and practice new recipes. Another great way to reach a customer is to ensure that they like the foods offered. Hold taste testing events with students to encourage them to try new foods and have the chance for their input on the breakfast menu options. Focus groups are also a great way to get student input, stakeholder participation. Use the Healthier Generations test, Taste Test Guide to find out how to conduct student taste tests from choosing products to analyzing the results. Nutrition education can help students have more acceptance of fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And integrating the Farm to School program can increase the intake of local products and have students appreciating the work that their community is producing. Nutrition education can be woven into subjects like math, science, language arts, history, and more of the core subjects. Also considering connecting with local farmers to implement farm to school practices or start a school garden. USDA's Team Nutrition has tons of resources, including school garden education kits and more. It is important to make the connection between nutrition and fueling the body and brain for students. So think about how your school will use, um, integrate uh, food, agriculture, and nutrition education into the classroom. If your school participates in breakfast in the classroom, that's a great time for a nutrition lesson. SNA's um, Smart Briefs reported this week that students in the Brownsville area school district in Ohio started each day of the National School Breakfast Week by eating local. And their food service director was quoted as saying, good nutrition is an important component of educating our students. So here we see that the Farm to School initiative is being implemented in that district. Let's take a, a look at um, cultural and ethnic foods and the influences the school community has for a great acceptance of breakfast. Due to the variety of foods allowed under the National School Nutrition Standards, schools can promote meals that embrace cultural diversity and include more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, lean meats, and dairy products. Air recipes from students, families, teachers, and showcase the different cultures and ethnicities represented in your school district. Minneapolis Public Schools, for example, develop an ethnic bowl station in their cafeteria, featuring a range of whole grains, vegetables, and toppings, which represent the flavor profiles of several of their international cuisines. So let's take a few minutes to look at a traditional breakfast menu. How could we modify this to be more appealing? Let's say this is a breakfast menu for a school in Southern California or in Texas or Florida that has high Hispanic Latino populations. So I'm thinking changing the egg and cheese sandwich to an egg and cheese burrito or a taco. Offering salsa as a fun side, which can actually meet part of the red orange vegetable offering. Instead of cereal or cinnamon buns, offer a whole grain pan dulce. That's sweet bread, not literally. And changing oranges to outrageous orange wedges or smiles or apples to amazing apple slices can also be appealing in terms of the name, description, and also the ease to, to be able to eat. So we've had a great, great discussion of school breakfast. And as you can see, there are numerous resources to support this. We'd love for you to take the information back from today's session to your district or your community. Just choose one breakfast idea to implement. 
We want to thank you for your time today. And now I'll entertain questions. To so see someone wrote that offer versus service optional breakfast for all grades. Yes, and it's actually very, um, very lucrative to put it across the board for all grades because, you know, kids can get to choose what they want to eat as long as they choose the components that meet a reimbursable meal. And someone asked you, can you do CEP for breakfast only? Yes, you can. But it's more lucrative too to do breakfast and lunch because you get the higher participation and that's what's been um, shown that the districts are getting those kinds of results okay well Thank you for your attention. And now I'm going to pass it over to Lindsay. All right, hello everybody. So my name is Lindsay Trawali and I'm here to talk about our school breakfast program here at Seattle Public Schools. So getting to know Seattle Public Schools, we have um, 102 schools this year with about 69,000 uh, full-time staff, uh, 27,000 students at the elementary level, 11,000 students at the middle school level, and 14,000 students at the high school level, which um, adds up to about 53,000 students. Uh, from those students, we serve about 6,000 breakfasts a day and 15,000 lunches each day. Our students speak uh, 147 different languages and uh, come from 150 different countries of origin. So you can see our top 10 languages are English, Spanish, Somali, Vietnamese, Cantonese, Amharic, Tagalog, Amaro, Tigrinya, and Mar uh, Mandarin. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Tagalog is um, typically spoken in the Philippines, uh, Amharic and Amaro. Oromo, I'm sorry, are um, from the Ethiopian region of Africa and uh, Tigrinya is Ethiopian and Eritrean. Some fast facts on our district. Uh, we have about 31% free and reduced price lunch. So that is a challenge for us trying to figure out how to entice um, families to eat with us rather than um, having them um, come in automatically if they if we had higher higher percentage of free and reduced price meals. 21% um, of our students are from non-English speaking backgrounds. We have 11% of English lear language learners, 13% receiving special education services, about 11% of advanced learners, 9% highly capable programming, and 3% experiencing homelessness. Uh, but we do still have an 82% graduation rate in our district. In addition to that, you can see that our student demographics, we have about 47% uh, Caucasian students with 14% African American or Black, 13.5% um, Asian, and 12% Hispanic Latino with 11% uh, multiracial students. So you can see that we have a very diverse uh, student population uh, with almost an even split between uh, male and female students. So at Seattle Public Schools, we run multiple different uh, programs in our nutrition services department. We have the National School Breakfast Program, National School Lunch Program, Child and Adult Care Food Program, 
after school snack program, fresh fruit and vegetable program. We also do um, interdistrict catering and we serve adult meals here in our district office um, in our deli. Um, so we serve students anywhere from uh, one year old all the way up to retirement age, uh, which is always a fun time. Uh, our CACFP programs uh, include Head Start and um, a daycare at one of our alternative high schools um, called the Parent Ed Lab. So we do serve um, little ones as young as one year old. And in our department here, we have um, our director, Aaron Smith, assistant director, Charlotte Marison, uh, personnel supervisor, Patty Dorgan, business manager, Jody Thomas, and myself. Um, those are the people who work year round and uh, kind of are the admin staff here in our district. And then we have uh, three area supervisors for the 103 schools, um, Annette, Jackie, and Heidi. So here at Seattle Public Schools, we run uh, three different types of breakfast programs. Uh, we have traditional breakfast, grab and go breakfast, and a second chance breakfast. And we'll go more into those in the upcoming slides. So traditional breakfast is exactly what you think it is. It's hot breakfast served in the cafeteria daily. Um, we always give two different options for breakfast. And one of those options is an individually wrapped item to make it easier for our grab and go programs. Uh, but also just to make it easier in the cafeteria, instead of doing uh, two highly complex breakfast items, we um, want to make sure that uh, we balance out um, labor and um, cost. So uh, one item might be more complex than the other item might be individually wrapped. Um, some days it might be both individually wrapped items, um, just depending on that menu, uh, menu day. And then in addition to our uh, two hot breakfast items that we serve in the cafeteria daily. We also do serve cereal daily um, and uh, some schools serve yogurt daily depending on the um, age level of the children. So I just wanted to give you a brief little look at our April menu. You can see um, this is my what I call my pretty menu um, that gets posted on our website and you can see the two different options for breakfast each day. Um, and um, kind of how they balance out. I do like to balance out between sweet breakfast and savory breakfast, individually wrapped and non-individually wrapped, and um, of course, meeting our meal patterns for the week. Next, we have grab and go breakfast. And uh, our grab and go breakfast is served in the cafeteria and taken to the classroom. Uh, we send them in clear plastic bags so that the students can uh, use offer versus serve and choose their own components for their breakfast. And when they get to the service um, counter with uh, to, to the cashier, um, the cashier is able to clearly see that they have a reimbursable meal in that clear plastic bag. Uh, and then the students can take that uh, bag to their classroom, put it down as a placemat on their table, um, and hopefully keep the mess as clean as possible in the classroom. Um, our grab and go breakfast is served with all individually wrapped entrees. Um, we use easy grab and go style fruits. So a full, a full apple, a full orange, a full pear, rather than um, fruits that might need uh, spoons or forks or things like that. Um, we also use mess free food. So we don't send any cereal to the classroom because of spillage um, or um, no syrup. Uh, in the classroom as well. We use uh, pre-flavored pre pancakes um, that are individually wrapped for that as well. So this grab and go style breakfast is typically used in our, at the elementary level um, and it is also our most popular um, alternate breakfast model. Uh, and here you can see some of the products that we use um, for our grab and go style breakfast. Um, one of the main things that I am uh, always looking for is more savory options for our grab and go style breakfast um, because we have a lot of uh, things wrapped in tortillas over and over again. So um, I'm constantly um, putting pressure on our on our uh, manufacturers and vendors um, to get creative and come up with uh, ideas for some savory breakfast options that are individually wrapped. 
Uh, next, we have our second chance breakfast. So second chance breakfast is um, mostly seen with our secondary schools. Um, it's served between first and second period in most schools um, and can either be served on a breakfast cart or in the cafeteria. Um, we find most success with when it's on a breakfast cart um, somewhere away from the cafeteria uh, where the students actually are. So if they are getting out of class all the way across campus from the cafeteria, um, we want that breakfast cart to be where the classrooms are so that students come out of the classroom, can grab a quick breakfast and um, be nourished for the rest of their day. Um, we still keep mess-free foods there. Um, so since they're older kids, they might have a little bit more options, um, like a yogurt parfait. They're a little bit less messy with the older kids than the younger kids. Um, and we might do um, a, a quick uh, cereal for them, depending on the school. Um, but typically, they have about 15 minutes in this passing period um, to have their second chance breakfast. Um, and we're also looking into um, vending machines, um, maybe for next school year, uh, where students will be able to get a reimbursable meal out of a vending machine with their PIN code. Um, which would be a really cool option. So um, in addition to carts, we were looking into other options as well. So in order to get these programs running and, and uh, for them to be successful, we partner with uh, a lot of different community partners around the greater Seattle area. Um, the main one that we partner with is United Way of King County. Uh, they do a lot of funding for the Grab and Go Breakfast program. Um, and then we also uh, partner with the Washington State Dairy Council, um, who helps us out with a lot of marketing and promotions, and um, they can also help us provide equipment like breakfast carts and um, smaller um, appliances. United Way of King County funds um, new grab-and-go breakfast programs in our district to provide universal breakfast to all students within the school. So um, they, pay for all of the students um, who do not qualify for free and reduced price meals. And they also pay for the extra labor that um, we have to put in in order to feed those extra students. Um, so right now in our district, um, that constitutes nine schools that they're funding for um, universal breakfast, which is the paid meal cost and the extra labor. And then in addition to that, they're also uh, funding all of our CEP schools labor. We currently have five schools on CEP. And um, since those students are already considered uh, free meals, United Way is footing the bill for the labor for that, which is a big deal in Seattle. We have a $16, $16 an hour minimum wage. Um, so in order to put in the extra effort and, and um, put in the extra labor for uh, serving all these extra students, um, that really helps our department out um, to have that financially um, financial aid for that. Um, so they also provide uh, volunteer staffing for new programs to ease the workload in uh, the early morning. So they might have one or two uh, volunteers who come out and um, help prep, prep in our kitchens. Um, or they might have the volunteers come out and do taste testing with the students to figure out which breakfast items are their favorite and which ones we should probably kick off the menu. Um, and then um, United Way is also um, the community partner who's funding um, our clear grab and go bags for our service. Um, so that is also a cost that we don't have to um, take on ourselves as a department. United Way is, is able to foot the bill on that one. And next we have the Washington State Dairy Council. Um, the Dairy Council is invested in our breakfast programs because um, dairy is served as an option at all meals. Um, so they are willing to step in and um, try to help us figure out how to really um, make kids interested in coming in. And also, um, obviously, they want to highlight the, the dairy part of the meal, but they also are, are focused on uh, well-balanced meals between all the food groups. Um, our Dairy Council here partners uh, with Fuel Up to Play 60 and our local uh, NFL team. So we have the Seattle Seahawks and um, we've, able, we've been able to have uh, our Seahawks mascot Blitz come out to several breakfast, different, different breakfast 
marketing uh, promotions, which has been really cool. Uh, creates a lot of hype. It gets the kids interested, kind of thinking what's going on and where's that music coming from? And um, they recognize Blitz because they, they see him on posters. They see him every Sunday during C Seahawks games. And um, he's always fun and, and gets the kids excited. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate our um, partnership with the Dairy Council. They provide posters, recipes, uh, giveaways. Um, they provided this dairy uh, dairy cart, breakfast cart uh, that you see in the pictures here on my slide. Um, and we're also currently discussing blenders with them to, to possibly do a um, smoothie smoothie breakfast promotion in the springtime. All right, and from here we're going to go on to our polling question. All right, so as you can see, um, the question was, what alternate breakfast models does Seattle sc secondary schools typically follow? Um, a lot of you said all of the, all of the above, but um, the actual answer is uh, answer B. Um, typically, our secondary schools follow a second chance breakfast. Uh, we do have all three I, uh, models in our district. However, the secondary schools are typically the ones that follow the second chance breakfast. So we will move on from here. Uh, breakfast promotions um, that we've done this year. Uh, I wanted to touch briefly on the National School Breakfast Week and also our hot chocolate milk program. So National School Breakfast Week, um, we have our lunch managers promote their own programs. Uh, so each lunch manager in each school um, comes up with their own decorations. They might um, put things in the daily announcements and just create general hype in the cafeterias. And then um, I create the menus. So I try to menu favorite items and scratch made items to really um, show the cool things that we can do um, in our school lunch program. So just briefly, I'll show you um, our production menu for um, National School Breakfast Week this year in March. Um, we highlighted our homemade granola and our homemade blueberry buckle. Um, and then we also participated in the Dairy Council's iBreakfast program uh, throughout the entire month where students were able to um, receive uh, tickets for participating in breakfast and then they can win prizes at the end of the month. Um, our hot chocolate milk program uh, was something new that we tried this year. Uh, we found that um, we only wanted to serve it at secondary schools um, uh, just to have the, the cool factor of holding a cup and uh, with a lid and a sleeve. Um, but um, we served it from November to December in the cold months of the year. And we saw the biggest jump in participation at middle schools. Um, we found that those students are the ones that can't drive off campus to actually go to Starbucks, um, but they did still want to have that cool cup in their hand when they saw their uh, friends in the morning. And we saw participation increase from 2 to 22%. And then challenges that we've had with breakfast. Um, each school building is set up differently. Not all schools have the same capacity for all service models. Um, we um, love our principals, but getting a hold of them can be tough. So coordination and cooperation with the school administrative staff can be hard. 
Um, dealing with different bell schedules, uh, some of our schools start really early and others start after nine o'clock in the morning. So um, breakfast really depends on what time of the day it is and it can be um, a three hour span for us between all of our schools. Um, and that changes whether students are interested or not. Um, also scheduling, is there enough time in that passing period for this second chance breakfast? Uh, do kids have enough time to make it all the way down uh, to the um, cafeteria from where they are if they don't have a breakfast cart? Um, and then other things like kitchen capacity, staffing, ovens, um, menus, et cetera, um, that um, might, might hinder um, a breakfast program um, and in our district I would say staffing is the the number one um, hindrance there and then just quickly things that um, our um, staff can do to help uh, talk talk their programs up we uh, try to incorporate harvest of the month into our breakfast as well as lunch uh, so things like berries apples grains etc um, local foods, dairy, fruits, and scratch made items. And then uh, every effort is made to eliminate products containing high fructose corn syrup, food dyes, and MSG from our menus. Um, so those are things that our lunch managers can talk to parents about, um, can maybe talk to our secondary students about if they're interested in those um, health um, things as well. Um, so yeah, I think we're Running close on time, I'm ready to take questions uh, for any of you that might have them. Um, so I've got one here, it says, did you serve standard chocolate milk warmed up um, uh, and served in the fun cup? Um, what do you think that made this successful in the middle school? So uh, we actually brought in um, gallons of chocolate milk rather than uh, cartons because with time and labor, um, as you can imagine, we had a lot of um, people not willing to open individual cartons of chocolate milk. Uh, so luckily our food distributor was able to find us gallons of chocolate milk uh, from a local dairy, um, which we um, were lucky to get uh, instructions from the, the dairy council in order to um, heat it up either in the steamer and the kettle. Um, we could serve it in a Cambro and the students can serve themselves or um, we could serve it in, um, keep it on our, our um, steam tables and serve it by, by ladling it into cups ourselves. Um, and what do I think that it made it so successful in the middle schools? I think it's just the age group. Um, they really are uh, influenced by um, what their friends think about them, um, but they're also not old enough to go drive to Starbucks themselves. So having that available in our cafeterias, I think made it successful for us. Um, and then um, someone asked, what is a blueberry buckle? Um, that's a good question. It is a blueberry breakfast bread, uh, one of our most popular items that we make here in house um, in our central kitchen. Um, if you, it's kind of like a coffee cake, but whole grain and um, has blueberries. Um, and then uh, what would you use for smoothies? That's something that we're still thinking about, um, but we're looking into um, different frozen fruits and yogurt and um, serving it with a grain item, maybe um, something that we already have or, or um, using our granola as well might be a good idea. What is your most popular high school breakfast item? That is a good question. Um, I think it depends on the area of our district. Uh, because we have such a large district, we have a lot of different geographical regions with different uh, preferences. And um, I would say the most overall popular item is probably our yogurt parfait. Um, but um, some schools really, really like our, our breakfast sandwiches and some schools really like our um, sweeter items. It just depends. Um, I think I'm going to turn it out, turn it over now to uh, Teresa. So thank you so much for uh, listening in, and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Lindsay. So we do have a couple of other School of Breakfast resources, and you can see the links on our slide here. The uh, Fool for Life 
is a very, very good resource. It has digital interactives, videos, information text, and much more. And also you can check out My Plate Guide to School Breakfast. And this is very colorful and share information with families. It's also in English and in Spanish. So just a final reminder that today's webinar has been recorded and can be viewed on the ICN website and theicn.org slash star. Please, please look for that evaluation that should arrive in your mailbox within the next 24 hours at the end of this webinar. And this concludes our March webinar. And remember to check for next month for another webinar on more exciting things going on in School of Nutrition. Thanks again to our speakers, Carol Chang and Lindsay Trawali. Have a great day.